if we were to go to the periodic table, and if I was to ask you silicon versus phosphorus, which one is more electronegative? Which one would be more electronegative? Phosphorus. Right, phosphorus. Now, if you think about the difference that the, the outermost electron sees between silicon and phosphorus, the outermost electron is in silicon, neutral silicon, sees 14 protons. Remember, that's the atomic number, the number of protons. It sees 14, 14 protons in the nucleus, but it has to see it through a veil of other electrons. So if you're one of 14 electrons, and you're the outermost electron, you're seeing this 14 proton or 14 plus charged nucleus, but you're also seeing these other 13 electrons shielding it or partially shielding it. Fortunately, the electrons aren't, those 13 other electrons aren't always in front of you, in between you and the nucleus. So, you know, you're only seeing a partially shielded nucleus. And if you go to phosphorus the situation, you're one of 15 electrons looking at a 15 plus nucleus. So the difference is that the nucleus is up like a, an extra charge of plus one, thinking about the perspective of that highest energy electron phosphorus electron versus the highest energy electron silicon nucleus. But the additional electron that you get from going from neutral silicon to neutral phosphorus doesn't completely shield that additional extra proton. So with that in mind, the outermost electron in phosphorus, like one of the highest energy electrons, sees a slightly higher positive charge even through those electrons that come in between once in a while. So the, the effective nuclear charge, which is what this is actually called, is a little higher going from silicon to phosphorus. So even after you think about all the shielding, all the other electrons getting in the way, you still see more positive charge. So how about, so yes, so that means that the electrons are more attracted like the outermost electrons are more attracted to the nucleus of phosphorus than the outermost electrons are attracted to the nucleus of silicon. So that means that phosphorus is going to be more electronegative than silicon. That's a skill you need to have to be able to tell me about the um, de degree to which the something is an ionic charge, or sorry, ionically bonded compound or a covalently bonded compound or a polar covalent compound. Um, you need to know these electronegativities to be able to do that. Tell me about phosphorus versus nitrogen. Which one's going to be more electronegative? Nitrogen will be more electronegative. And you, the way you think about this is you think about the different orbitals that the outermost electrons will be in. Here it's going to be a 2p orbital. Here for phosphorus it's going to be a 3p orbital. The 3p orbital is a lot bigger. So just because you have these charges being separated by a bigger space on average, it's going to be less attracted to the nucleus. So the outermost electrons of phosphorus are going to be less attracted to the nucleus of phosphorus than the outermost electrons of nitrogen just because they're further away on average. So that's all. Um, the bigger effect here is the effect of, not really bigger, the greater effect here is the uh, change in electronegativity going from one row to the next one. So like going down a column reduces the electronegativity a lot more than going across one does. So these periodic trends up and down are much more bigger differences or much greater differences than left to right. Um, okay, so... If I think about water, it's H2O. It's covalently bonded because water, sorry, hydrogen isn't really a metal. It's, it's more of a nonmetal, and oxygen is a nonmetal, so it's going to be covalently bonded. Oxygen is going to be more electronegative than hydrogen, so I would expect for there to be a partial positive charge on hydrogen and a partial negative charge on oxygen that corresponds from the electrons being shared much, much less to the hydrogen than they are to the oxygen. So that's the kind of reasoning you need to be able to do, and the periodic trends need to be there in your mind to be able to do this stuff consistently. Um, this is a depiction of a polar covalent bond. This is trying to show you that there's more electron density around this fluorine than there is a 
around this hydrogen and I guess what they're showing you is the bonding electrons hopefully and not just total electrons because otherwise this would be kind of a weird thing to show you but this should be demonstrating to you that there's more electron density around this fluorine. So I think there's some Alex questions about this like look at this bond what does it look like to you and you're supposed to be able to characterize that if it's unequal sharing we're talking about a polar covalent bond. Polar indicating that's unequal, covalent meaning that it's still sharing. Okay, so yeah, electronegativity is just that ability of an atom in a molecule, or sorry, a nucleus in a molecule to attract shared electrons to itself. So if there's unequal electronegativity, then there's going to be unequal sharing. And we already talked about this a lot. You have a good intuition for it, so you'll have ways to reproduce this even if you forget the trends on a test. Um, here's a table of different electronegativities. You may use it if you want. Um, I would just remember the trends and then you're good to go. Hydrogen's less electronegative than pretty much, you know, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur. <laughs> You'll actually, if you go online, you'll actually find multiple different scales of electronegativity. Um, there's an empirical one that's based on just taking an average of electron affinity and electron ionization energy, both of which can be measured independently. Linus Pauling came up with his own scale. So bear in mind, different people have come up with different ways to express electronegativity. Um, <clears throat> this is how you write a dipole moment. So you draw, a dipole is a charge separation. So if you have a positive charge and a negative charge separated by a distance, that's a dipole. And you can write it by writing a plus, or like the tail end of an arrow, at the positive end, and the pointy end, or the arrowhead end of an arrow, at the partial negative charge. So that's what a dipole looks like. That's how you depict it. And every time there's a polar bond, you actually have a dipole that you could draw overlapping or at the very crudest parallel to that bond. The delta notation, as I mentioned before, means partial positive or partial negative charge. And the plus or the minus indicates whether or not it's positive or negative. There can be multiple dipole moments inside of the same molecule. And you could try to average those out to come up with a total overall dipole moment for the overall molecule, which may or may not be the same as any of the dipole moment directions that you've drawn for any of the uh, bonds themselves. You have to take like an average, and the average might not be the same as the contributors to that average. Um, yeah. So... Do I do water by itself? Apparently not. Let's do water. Let's do a, the bonding of water and thinking about water, and then we'll actually derive where this comes from. So we live on Earth, right? Earth has a lot of water. It's good to know about water. It's in our bodies. Um, a lot of hedge funds are really interested in water right now. I think they're nuts, but they might be right. I'm often wrong. So this is a Lewis structure for water. Let's talk about the dipole moments here. Um, which is more electronegative, oxygen or hydrogen? Oxygen is more electronegative. So that means if there's this, for these shared electrons between the hydrogens and the oxygen, each of these bonds is going to have a partial negative charge on the oxygen and a partial positive charge whoops on each hydrogen why am I saying that I'm saying that because the oxygen is more electronegative so it is gonna hog the electrons that are being shared in these bonds so that's gonna give it an overall positive sorry overall negative electronegative uh, overall negative charge partial negative charge and the hydrogens will have a partial positive charge based on that unequal sharing. And if I had to draw dipole moments on these bonds, I would draw them as like that. So like those are the dipole moments. 
they point to the negative charge and away from the positive charge. So there you go. The overall dipole moment for this molecule looks like this. So I average those two bonds and those two bond dipoles and I get this overall dipole for water. So there is a positive end, the end with the hydrogens, and there's a negative end, the end with the oxygen. So this makes water a very, very, very good solvent for uh, dissolving different ions. So a lot of ionic compounds will actually be dissolved by water. And the cations of ionic compounds will be dissolved by the water molecules that orient their partially negative oxygen ends towards the positively charged ion. And then the anions, the negatively charged ions, will have water molecules orient themselves around them so that the partially charged, partially positively charged hydrogen ends are closer to the anion. That's why water is such a good solvent.